To go back 54 years is a long time. And during those 20 years before the Lord saved me, I lived a life that was altogether in contrast to what I am by the grace of God. Some time ago, and indeed it was maybe about 10 years after the Lord saved me, I came back to the area where I lived, and my old partners in trouble and in mischief, they'd come one after another and they'd say, Hey, are you the Jeff Harrison that we knew so many years ago? It was no credit to me. It's by the grace of God I am what I am. And there's nothing too hard for the Lord, my friend. Nothing too hard. Maybe you've given yourself up. You're just hopeless. Maybe like I was, ignorant of what God expected. But I want to tell you this. God's not asking for theologians. He's not asking for self-respectable people. God is asking for sinners to trust his son. And there's power in the blood of Christ today to cleanse you from your sins. I was brought up very strictly, but it didn't make any difference to my life. I went to the local church, but it was just a covering for my sin and for my mischief. And I'd like to say, my dear friend, that a strict upbringing is no entrance into heaven. To be told what you should do and what you shouldn't do will never guarantee you a place in glory. And the fact that you come to a place of worship Sunday by Sunday isn't going to favor you before God against a poor sinner that's a drunkard or any other kind. Self-respectability and religion have never saved a soul. But I tell you this, they've deceived many a soul in going down to hell. There's only one salvation. And the Apostle Peter puts it like this. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. If you're going to be saved, you'll have to come the same way that I came and the same way that everybody else came. I came to Jesus as I was, weary, worn and sad, and found in him a resting place, and he made me glad. I lived and was brought up on the respectable side of a slum area. But I tell you this, I was more in the slum area than I was on the respectable side of the street. And there as a young fellow I learned a lot of things. And I did a lot of things that my parents were completely unaware of. And it wasn't until the policeman called now and again at the door and warned my parents that if there was no change in that lad of theirs, then there'd only be the prison for the lad. And my mother has said more than once, as she's found out the things that I've been guilty of, you'll either end your days in jail are on the gallows. So you can see, my friend, I wasn't a goody-goody. I was just the bad lad of the family, and yet it pleased God to save me so. I took an interest, not in intellectual things, though without boasting, I finished third in the whole school, but that's beside the point. I wasn't interested in that kind of thing, but I was interested in sport and especially in wrestling. I loved it. 
and as a young fellow of 17 or 18 years of age, the roughs had come to the door and asked me was I coming out. And it was just that we should take our shirts off and we'd have a wrestling match together. I could do it too. Couldn't do it now. I've gone to seed now. I'll admit that. But I could do it then. And I could put a fellow twice my weight on his shoulders too before he knew where he was. But he got me in that kind of a company that I'd just go to a church on the Sunday night and underneath it there was mischief all the way. Oh, I'd got the strength of an ox and approved it. They wouldn't stand too near to me in an argument, my dear friend. No, they wouldn't. Jeff Harrison was known for the temper that he had. And I'd put a fellow down on the ground if he argued a bit too much. I didn't care for men. And I was too ignorant of God to care for God either. You could give me a wall higher than that and just give me a little lip about two feet up and I'd be over that wall before you knew it. I learned all these things because you had to learn them if you were going to keep yourself intact and if you were going to keep yourself free. My friend, I didn't drink. I saw enough of that in the home. I didn't smoke. And I'll tell you why I didn't smoke. My mother promised us a gold watch if we never smoked till we were 21. And I was the only one that never smoked till I was 21. But I never got my gold watch because my mother didn't like me being saved. <laughs> so I lost my gold watch. But I tell you this, I reckon there'll be a gold crown up there instead, eh? To them that look for his appearing. I'd rather have that. And you don't glory in your shame. But perhaps it'll awaken something in your own heart. I could walk in and out of a shop. And I'd be richer coming out than when I went in. And nobody would know anything about it. That's mischief. That's not just mere robbery. That's calculated mischief. And that's the kind of fellow you're looking at tonight. So if you're thinking that I was born with a Bible in my hand, and if you're thinking that the third first words that I ever uttered was a hymn, then don't be deluded. I was a sinner in need of Christ. And God knew it. And I didn't. And that went on for 19 years. Almost 20 years. And it pleased God to save me soul. And I'll tell you how it happened. You ought to count it a privilege to be in a place like this and listen to the word of God being read and the gospel being preached which is the power of God unto salvation to every one that believeth. You ought to thank God that the way of life is being told to you Sunday by Sunday. And while you've got the opportunity, then lay a hold upon that message and trust Christ that you may be saved. Because I tell you this, tomorrow might be too late. I'd been saved a couple of months I'd become a Christian and the parson of the church that I went to he asked where I'd got to I said I'm going to the place where I heard the gospel of Christ and I'm a Christian he said couldn't you hear the gospel of Christ in the church that you've been coming to I said for 20 years you've had the opportunity and I've never heard it once and neither did I. And then he started to ask me questions about my Bible a couple of months after being a Christian. And I had to say, I don't know. I don't know. 
I don't know. He said, you're very ignorant, aren't you? I said, I'm the result of 20 years of your teaching. And I don't know anything about God. And I don't know anything about my way to heaven. My friend tonight, don't be deluded, will you now? Salvation is only through faith in Christ. It would be over 12 months before it pleased God to save my soul. That the whole burden of my sin fell upon my heart. And I didn't know what it was. Listen, my brother preacher. You can talk about repentance as much as you like, but explain it, won't you? I didn't know what these words meant. I had no idea of what the Bible was talking about. But I did know this, that the weight of my sins was far too great for me to bear. And with the weight of my sin came the fear of meeting God. And I was terrified lest I should die. And I wouldn't go out of the house except it were to work or except it were to somewhere that I had to go to. I wouldn't go out lest I met with an accident and I'd go out into eternity and meet God. I was afraid to do it. And I tell you, though I had a body that many a lot would have been jealous of, my parents, they thought I was in a decline. My weight just fell off until I became a wreck. And God never told me what he was doing. And he left me like that. And he left me like that for almost two years. And I used to cry out, God, show me the way, show me the way. And he wouldn't. And I used to take a Bible, twice as big as that one, a great big leather-bound Bible to work. And I didn't care that the men laughed when they saw me bring it out to read it. I wanted to know what was the matter with me. And I wanted to know why I was afraid to meet God. I wanted to know why I was afraid to die. And I started at Genesis chapter 1. And I learned my Bible was too big to be able to come to something that God would use to save me soul. I'd sin, and I'd hate myself for sinning, because it only meant that I was worthy of going down to hell all the more. And I felt as though I'd been hung literally over hell, and I've cried, and I've cried, and I've cried, and God never said a word, and he left me. And I remember on three occasions I was brought face to face with sudden death. All right to listen to it. But I tell you this, if you ever had to pass through the experience, it'd be different. Might surprise you to know that I used to work at a cinema. I was a second operator used to look at pictures 15 times a week and I did that for almost four years. So I've seen more than a lot of you put together, I think. And of course, the second house finished at half past ten or later. And by the time you'd got everything set and in order, you were leaving that place at eleven o'clock. And this was a pitch black, dirty night. And I always had to walk over a clay field and in that field a man had dug a hole that he called his grave. It was like a grave, the shape of a grave. It was as deep as a grave. And he'd thrown the clay over on either side. And with the weather and the water it had all smoothed down. And had filled up with water. And in that pitch black night I fell into that. My feet wouldn't touch the bottom. 
and I'd try to claw, getting hold of the clay, and my hands had just slipped down the clay and back into the water, and I'll tell you this, I don't know even till today how I got out of that. That grave almost became my grave, and I tell you, if I was afraid to die before, I was terrified then, and God didn't do anything. God didn't do anything. On another occasion, I was responsible for an overhead crane, and you know how you, how you go up the, the steel ladder, and you get familiar with it, and you just run up, and this time as I ran up, I bumped me. And when I came down a rung or two and looked up, I'd hit the porcelain bobbin that held the wire. An inch or two or either side, and I'd have been a cinder. I tell you, I climbed into that little cabin, and I couldn't do a thing but tremble. I wonder why God ever did that to me. I was frightened enough to begin with. And God did it twice. He brought me face to face with death. Then, the third time, I worked on the railway. I worked in the sheds. And I'd formed a companionship with one of the firemen. And we had a freight train going out from the yard away through to Manchester and there was a very steep incline and if he had a full load then he could give a toot on the whistle and he could demand another engine behind him to help him up the bank. And this time the freight train had done it and my friend on his engine was the one to help him up the bank. And he gave a toot on the whistle for me. He wanted me to go with him. And I looked out of the window and he'd left it a bit late. And I ran out and across the yard and up the incline of the platform, the station platform. And I ran the length of the platform and was just ready to get hold of the rail to get onto the footplate. And I'd reached the decline at the other end of the platform. And if it was running before, my, I was flying then. And I tripped over the, the starting signal wires. And I was going headlong in the direction of the last wheel of the engine. Have you ever been in a position like that? I've heard some people say they'd be terrified. But I'm going to tell you this. You stop thinking altogether. It had all gone. And as I was going straight in the direction of the wheel, there was only one thing that was in my mind. I'm going to meet God. I'm going to meet God. And the steps up to the footplate, they just give my shoulder a mighty push and just pushed me out of the way of that last wheel in time. And I lay there for a long time, bruised and frightened to death. I wondered why. Three times, a rebel like me, a wicked sinner like me, that my parents said nothing but the gallows of jail, that God should hang me over the pit and make me scream and make me cry and bring me face to face with death in such a way. Why did he do it? Look, he pleased God to hear me cry. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him. And he was a poor man he hadn't got a thing to boast in. 
He hadn't got a thing to present to God. He was just a poor, bankrupt man. And he cried in all his need. This is how it happened. Bond of the fireman, a good Christian. Do you know, God seemed to do nothing. But I'm going to tell you this. God was pondering the path of my feet before I ever became a Christian. My father, he was the local secretary of the joiners' union. So I'd got to be a joiner. <laughs> and he got me a job with one of his compatriots. I was to be bound apprentice. I gave my notice in at the cinema. And halfway through the week, my mother came to the cinema. And I'm sure my father never knew. She said, don't take the job. So I didn't. And some weeks afterward, a man came to the door. He said, there are two positions on the railway. And nobody knows about them yet. I'm sending my son for one. Perhaps you'd like to send your son for the other. And we both got the jobs. And when I went into the engine sheds, there was a Christian man. A godly man. A man that he was a worse man than I was, if he can talk about being worse. He'd been a filthy drunkard, and God had saved him. And he was going to get married. He knew that I played the organ. He said, will you play the organ at my wedding ceremony? And I played the organ. And at the reception I met a company of people that talked about God as though they knew him. And they weren't afraid to talk about God. And they weren't afraid to talk about meeting God. And I thought, oh, I wish I knew what they'd got. And I was too shy to talk to them. When they came back from their honeymoon, they invited me to tea on Sunday night. And like a lamb I went. I know why they do it now. You can't sit down at a brother's table and have tea on a Sunday night and refuse to go to the gospel meeting, can you? And that's what it was. And I went to the gospel meeting that night. It was in August. That's as near as I can tell you. And I can't tell you the exact date because I never thought of putting the date down. But it was a Sunday night. And the preacher was a Scot. He was 75 years of age. He was an Oxford University man. His name was John Campbell. And I'll tell you the text he preached on. Let your speech be always with grace and seasoned with salt. And I've tried for 54 years to get a gospel message out of that and I can't get one. So I don't know what he was talking about. But my, while he was talking, he just let this good news drop that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And if we trust him as our saviour, the burden of our sins is gone and we have peace with God. I tell you, my friend, I wanted to get up there and then and I wanted to tell the preacher on the platform that the Lord had saved me so. The meeting was too long altogether. And I danced. I danced all the way home for sheer joy. When I got home that night from the gospel meeting, they could tell there was something different. And I told the whole of the family, my grandparents, my parents, my brothers and my sisters, that had trusted Christ and I was going to heaven, my sins were forgiven. I expected them all to get saved. And they threw me out of the house. You're not going to make a disgrace of religion, they said. You've made a disgrace of everything that you've touched. And you're not going to do it with religion. 
And my own mother just used to put the plate in front of me and never say a word. And she did that for months. And it pleased God to keep me every day. And help me as I read his word. And help me to go on by his grace. Until a man at the other end of the terrace. He watched me go by and he watched me come back. And he saw the difference in that Jeff Harrison that he used to know. And he came along the terrace and he knocked to the door. He knew my mother's attitude to me. And my, he gave my mother the biggest telling off that she's ever had, I'm sure. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. The way you treat that lad. I wish he was a lad of mine. I'd be proud of him. And that's what the grace of God had done in just a couple of months. There was nothing in my circumstances at all that was conducive to being a Christian. Oh, I could take you back to the place. Now and again on rare intervals ago. I've taken my children back again and showed them the house where I lived. And I said, before you get too proud, that's where your dad came from. And they're the circumstances that your dad lived in. So you'll be careful what you say. Or else your dad will blow the bubble and let everybody else know who you belong to. My, my, my. Have you ever seen women fight with knives? Have you ever seen them roll about the dirty street? Seeking to cut each other to death? Have you seen them like that? Have you seen a man flung through the window? Out into the street? Have you seen men take hold of a policeman? And just tread him under their feet? As though he were dead? My, that was the place. Where I lived. And that's the place where God saved me so. It wasn't very long before the whole of the area knew that Jeff Harrison was a different man. And that's how it ought to be. You young brethren, that's how it ought to be. And I'd go around the houses of all that slum area and I'd knock at the doors and I'd give them gospel literature and they'd want to talk with me. And they'd come to the door. And if my mother went, they'd say, is that lad of yours in? We want him to come and pray with either their husbands or the lads or something. They used to say, we'd rather have that lad of yours than the priest. Isn't that good? They knew what it was. But they knew what the grace of God had done. And I've led many a soul to Christ in those humble homes in the slum area. We'd go once a month and we'd stand in the streets of the locality and we'd preach the gospel openly and if ever I walked into the middle of the ring they'd come and stand at the doors and they'd made the children be quiet until I'd finished speaking. Listen, my friend, I'm not boasting. I'm giving God all the glory. That's what the grace of God can do. Listen, have you ever seen a gambling ring? Have you ever seen one? No, perhaps you're brought up in too respectable an area. I tell you this. They'd all gather in a back entry. Eh? A back entry. And they'd have one there at that end. And they'd have another one at that end. And they used to call it keeping nicks for the policeman. And there'd be 20 or 30 men there with the cards and with all the money. Eh? If they saw me come, by the time I got there, there wouldn't be a card to be seen. And neither would there be a penny to be seen. And they'd just take it all away. I reckon they were more afraid of me than they were of the policemen. And they'd all take a tract, just like that. 
as though they were all angels. On one occasion, hey, Ioana, she was an old Irish woman. She was one of them that used to do the fighting with knives as well. <laughs> My, she was a bad one. Do you know, I wasn't brought up in a house where there was a nice garden in front. It was the pavement. And then it was the road. And if the weather was nice, I used to sit on the front doorstep and read my Bible. And I remember this old Irish woman. If she saw me there and she was passing, she'd say, shove up. <laughs> and I used to have to move up on the step. And then she'd sit down alongside me. And now she'd say, read that book for me as well. My, that old woman, I'm quite sure, the Lord saved us all. Hmm? God saves sinners. And he doesn't only save sinners. He keeps them as well. And he does more than keep them. He can use them for his own praise and his own glory. And I remember I was just 12 months old in the faith. That's all. Just 12 months. And this brother that got married that I played the organ for, he should have been at a place about 40 miles away. And there was some sickness in the family and he couldn't go. He said, you were going. I'd never spoken in my life. I was even too shy to stand in front of people. Listen, my friend, you might think this strange, but this is a fact. If you'd have told me 50-odd years ago that this is where I'd be tonight, I'd have thought you were mad. If I was walking up that side of the road and there were some Christians coming down the same side, I'd cross over on the other side. I was that shy. I just didn't want to meet them. And I had this meeting stuck right into my hand. And he walked away and he left me no excuses. And that night I went to this place and I preached. And God saved a woman. The first time that had opened my mouth. And I believe God was putting a seal upon the work. The God that can direct your feet up out of the horrible pit and the miry clay and set them up on a rock is the God that can lead you by a right way through the wilderness so that you can say, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Listen, I didn't know John 3.16 in the book. Twenty years of age. If he'd have said John 3.16... I'd have thought you were looking for a train or something. But I loved it. And I'll tell you something more, young men, before you get too old. For the first three or four years of my Christian experience, I was never in bed before two o'clock in the morning, sometimes never going to bed, and asking God to show me his word and let the book live. I believe God honors that. And the time came that here and there and somewhere else and somewhere else they would ask for me to come and preach and later to teach until I was doing as much work then as I'm doing now and still trying to do my daily job as well. And the Lord burdened my soul about serving him full time. Perhaps that's why God dealt with me the way that he did in saving my soul because I needed a lot of convic convincing. And God had to make it clear that God was dealing and God was going to save. And my, he worked and he made me tremble. And God was making it clear that he wanted me out there and he wanted me to serve him and not to be serving men. And I waited and I waited and I waited and I wouldn't go. And all around they knew and they were asking when and why. 
And I said, a wife and three children. God will meet their need, he said. I said, God won't meet their need and he won't meet my need either if I'm going to do it without him. And the burden became so great that I said to my wife, I used to give a week of my holidays so that I could go further afield. And this time I was going right across the country. A conference over there in Suffolk on Good Friday. Another on the Saturday. Another on the Monday. And then a week down in Kent later on. I said to my wife, if I'm asked for meetings, I'll take them. And during that week, I was asked for five weeks meetings. And I accepted them. And I came back to my wife and I said, I've committed myself to the Lord. I'm going into full-time work on September the 4th. And Easter was early in March. But I said, I don't want to give my job up. The devil will only come and he'll only say, Ah, oh, you are ready to get away from your job, that's all. Well, go and ask the Lord to shut my job up. And one of the directors of Lever Brothers, I was working at a nursing home at the time. One of the directors of Lever Brothers came to the home and said to the matron, We are losing with this home we've got to increase the entrance fee from four guineas to twelve guineas a week that was a lot of money in those days i'm going back to 1949 now and he was back a month afterward he said how's the book very poor very poor she said can't expect ordinary workmen to pay twelve guineas a week for two weeks for the wives to be in here he said, when do you expect your last patient to go out? She looked. May the 26th. He said, that'll be the last patient. And the home will close. Well, she called us all in to tell us. I expected the Lord to close my job. But I didn't expect him to close the home as well. Well. It was like being on air that God could answer a prayer like that. And when I got halfway home, May the 26th, September the 4th, what do you do in between? And there was a problem. But I kept on. And the last week the matron called me into her office. She said, have you got other employment? I said, no. She said, I'm glad in a way. The West Cheshire Hospital Board have bought this home. The house, the grounds, everything that's in the house. And they're not in a position to take over. And they want to know if any of the staff will come and live in the house till they are. I thought about you. You can bring your wife. You can bring your three children. So I'm going to tell you this. I've lived in a better mansion than any of you that I know of anyway. My, it was a lovely place. A lovely place. First time my wife had ever had an electric washer. Marvellous place. Do you know when they took over? On September the 3rd. As I was ready to go out. On September the 4th. Hmm? That was 34 years ago, the September just gone. And for 34 years, God has kept a poor sinner like me, that he hung over hell, that he threatened with death three times to make me know and to feel and to cry out because I was a sinner, ready to trust Christ as his saviour. My friend tonight, when you trust Christ, it's just the beginning. There are greater things to follow, things that you could never understand until you trust Christ first. The Lord is my shepherd. He leadeth. 
he guideth, he maketh me to lie down, and so on and so on, till we dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Listen, take the world, give me Jesus. You can have all its pleasures, you can have everything that it's got to offer, you're not talking to a man that was brought up in a Christian home. I was the first one. And I was the first one for ten years. And it pleased God to save my mother, my grandmother, and my elder brother when they saw that God not only saves, but he keeps. The door's wide open for you. He'll save you tonight. If you'll come as a sinner and trust his son as your saviour and it'll open a door and it'll bring you a peace and it'll bring you joy such as you've never, never known before. I trust that God will bless this testimony and use it for his glory. Shall we pray?